Welcome to 2021, our first episode, number 49. Today we're going to talk about... 41. Oh, 49. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to come back to the legendary coach today for the 49ers, Bill Walsh. Segue. Hear what I mean, not what I say. Thank you, Dan. <laughs> We're just picking up right where we left off with our audience. There's the freaking frack show. But who's on first? <laughs> who's on first? Well, number 41. Stand corrected. And, you know, it's about compassion. So let's first, before I tell a story and segue in here, let's just define compassion. Compassion is demonstrating sympathy, feeling, empathy, care, concern, sensitivity, uh, tenderness, mercy, love brotherly love. Those are all descriptions of compassion. Now, there are incidents in lives and careers of leaders that become defining moments for their leadership. Let's take the younger Bush. There's two examples here. The first moment occurred early in his first term. It was 9-11, and it defined that term in his office. On September 11, 2001, as we all know, the United States was attacked by terrorists who crashed the planes in the World Trade Center in the Pentagon. Now, the people in the United States, we were angry. We, you know, we were fearful. They were uncertain about the future. And they were mourning in thousands of us. And, and so Bush, just four days after the collapse of the World Trade Center towers, Bush went to ground zero. He spent uh, time there with the firefighters, the police officers, and the rescue workers. He shook their hands. He listened. He took in the devastation. Many of you probably can think of him on the rubble with you know, his arm around uh, uh, the, the firefighter at that time. And he told the people, he says, hey, the nation sends its love and compassion to everyone who's here. Now, reports that lifted the spirits uh, of the tired uh, searchers and, and, and his shaking of the hands and just talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. He met them where they were. Now, the cameras captured Bush, if you recall, as I mentioned, standing in the wreckage with his arm around the firefighter, Bob Beckwith. And, he, and, then when, and when some members of the crowd shouted out they couldn't hear him, Bush called back, I can hear you. The rest of the world hears you. And the people who knock these buildings down will hear all of us soon. The people cheered. They felt validated. They felt understood. He demonstrated the empathy. You know, Bush had connected with him in no other in in in, in a way no one had seen him do prior to that moment. Now, fast forward, the beginning of his second term. Let's call this one Nobody's Home. Katrina hit. Well, it was terrible. And it was, you know, August 31st, 2005, just two days after the, you know, the landfall of the Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans. You know, the levees broke, water flooded into the city. Instead of visiting the city as he did in New York after 9 11, Bush flew over New Orleans, as you might recall. In Air Force One, peering through the window of the jet small windows to see the damage to the people of, of the Gulf Coast. It was a picture of indifference. You know, the mayor was crying out, no one's listening, I'm not getting any support. The city's flooded, he sends them all to the Superdome. That's where you're going to be housed. And then he had to move them from there because it was starting to fill up. They had to go to the Astrodome. No connection. Later on, you know, to Bush's credit, the mayor, after the you know got reelected the next year, did thank Bush, did thank the federal government for everything they've done, but it was too late. The imprint was made. So compassion, you know, the byproduct of compassion. If you demonstrate compassion, well, the byproduct is retention. People will follow you. People, that old saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. People touch the heart and the people will follow. I think people aren't going to move until you give them, make an emotional connection with them for the most part. And that's the thing that 
of all the different bits of wisdom that I hear people repeat that they have learned from you, that's the A number one piece of wisdom that gets repeated uh, if we think back to our uh, episode with, and, and I'm totally blanking on his name, U.S. Advisors Insurance. Oh, with Rod. Rod Crandall. Brother Rod. That's one of the things that he pointed to. People don't care how much you know until you know how much you care. And that is a great lead-in to episode 41 of the Valuability Podcast, Compassion, our first episode in 2021. The Valuability Podcast is for financial professionals, business owners, and anyone interested in financial planning, business, leadership, and personal development. We believe that financial success comes from building a plan on the foundation of your values and building your ability will help you get there. My name is Dan Forth Fleek. I was a financial advisor and wholesaler for over 20 years. I'm joined each week by my co-host, friend, and mentor, Philip Simonson. Also in financial services for over 40 years in various roles, including financial advisor, field leader, sales trainer, and a senior manager covering areas such as advisor development and field operations. Uh, so, Philip, I have a quick funny story for you. Uh, I was going through my password keeper the other night, and I came across an entry in it, and it was an account number. And I... At different institutions, I have multiple accounts for different things because we've got the business, we've got the podcast, right. we've got my my own personal stuff. And this was a an account number for this institution. And then in parentheses, it said PCS. And I was just like, P hmm. PCS, personal communication system, Who, PCS. I just, I was racking my brain all night. It was like three or four hours. All of a sudden, I'm like... Philip C. Simonson. <laughs> so it only took me a couple hours to figure it out, but I thought you would get a chuckle yes, at, at that one. So you can find the Evaluability Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and TuneIn. You can also find us on YouTube. Uh, search Value-Ability on YouTube to find us there. Or you can find us on our website, value-ability.com, under the Episodes tab. And all of our episodes are in the player. Wherever you find us, please like, review, subscribe, and share. And in fact, just right now, listen. We After taking December off, we need to get our listening numbers back up. So <laughs> if there are some old episodes you want to go back and review, that would be awesome. Uh, but also, please do share us with people as we enter into this new year. It's the, the best thing you can do for us. If you would like to connect with us, our email is info at value-ability.com. Again, that's info at value-ability.com. Or you can reach out to us through social media. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook links are all at value-ability.com under the Contact Us tab. When I was first thinking about this episode, Sai, the story that popped into my mind actually was a story that I want to say it was probably about five or six years before my mom died. Mm -hmm. We and I can't even remember the context of how the conversation came up, but she mentioned to me at one point that during parent teacher conferences when I was a kid, teachers would often comment that I was overly empathetic with other students. That they would point out that I spent so much time worrying about what was going on with other people that I, I didn't focus on my own work. And I don't, and I kind of remember being that way as a kid, but at, at the time, it's one of those conversations that you have that you're like, oh, yeah, okay, maybe somebody mentioned it at some point. Fast forward then after my mom died and I was going through her files, I ended up finding my elementary school parent teacher reports that she had gotten from that. And 
repeatedly the mo- the biggest comment was a that I didn't apply myself and wouldn't focus. Um, but secondly, it was that I spent too much time worrying about what other people were doing. <laughs> and she was spot on. <laughs> so it, it, it breeds an interesting question. Can you be overly compassionate and overly empathetic? And it, the answer to that is yes, you can. Yes. You can, as I was as a child, spend so much time focusing on that side of things that you you don't focus on the actual work uh, but it, it's really kind of a myth that soft managers those that are empathetic are are less effective uh, to me it's always been a mix right that i was just talking to my good friend about this that I was probably in my mid thirties when I finally busted through my own mental myth that I did better work unsupervised, which is just a lie. If somebody's watching me, I work way better. <laughs> and not that I'm not motivated and, you know, being a wholesaler for 15 right. years, I did get better at it, at holding myself accountable. But the reality is for most people, if somebody's watching you, you're going to, run things a little bit tighter but it's a mix there right if you want somebody that is going to hold you accountable but also somebody that's going to be empathetic at the same time yes and you bring up a couple great points here and you know our podcast is about as we said compassion but you know we can look at it two ways compassion as a leader as well as democracy demonstrating compassion as just an individual, an individual producer, and where it can work with you or <laughs> create a disconnect. Now, as I look at uh, compassion as a leader, and the first first thing you mentioned there is, you know, you got to connect, right? But you got to, with people. And that's what compassion is. But first, you got to connect with yourself first. So know thyself. Or, or and that's and how do you know thyself? That's becoming self-aware. And that's internal, not looking at you know externally, and it's inwardly out. So you got to spend time to know yourself and that self-accountability. Once you have that self-accountability, and that's the number one indicator if someone's going to be successful, and you were successful as a wholesaler, very successful, you could manage and hold yourself accountable, and you orchestrate your own talents and resources, and you can't start leading others until you gain confidence. Now, there's different levels. What I want to share with the people here now on the leadership side, think about there's different levels of leadership and sources of power, and that, you know, whether or not we, we, you and I always, I like the reference. And so to, you know, the pyramid, we've been doing that you and I for years. So at the base, right, the base of the pyramid, you know, is, it's the first level of management and the first level of management, you're given a title. There's not a lot of skills and knowledge that have been developed here. So now this gives you your, your first source of power, that power by title. People have to follow you because they have to. You have that power of title, which allows you to hire, fire, reward, or punish. Now, as you go up that pyramid, the next source of power is, you know, people will follow you because they want to. And they only will want to hear is if you've demonstrated that compassion or that reverent loyalty. Reverent loyalty is the respect. And and you won't gain reverent loyalty or compassion by being there for the people when they needed you to be there for them. You met them where they were. Connect with people, but you met them where they, they needed to be. And that, you know, what I, I guess I'll just expound on that now. Uh, look, you understood their culture. You understood diversity and the differences between maybe how you were raised and how they were raised. You understood the backgrounds from their education perspective. Maybe they have, you know, a college education. Maybe they don't. Maybe they have a master's, you know, and, and, you know, PhD, and maybe you don't, but you need to meet them where they are, not where having them meet you where you are. 
and getting to know also their families and their, you know, I would always want to know the family's name, you know, the children, are they married? Do they have a partner? You know, what are their children's names? I would like to, you know, what are your dreams? We call it that. And I learned that from Doug Lennon, you know, the witty wiffy, what do you want for yourself? And then helping them achieve it. So then, you know, people will follow you because again, they want to. However, like you said, that soft side of leadership, the next source of uh, reason why people level of leadership, if you only, if you make people feel good, but don't get any results or take them anywhere, that's the country club style of leadership. You're in, or like I always joke the seventies, I'm aging myself. You're okay. I'm okay. And no one went anywhere. Right. You know, <laughs> it's just, you got, you got to get results. And, and, and so you got to demonstrate production. Now the people follow you because of your expertise power. That other source, you know, you know, first one was, you know, they follow you because of title, power of title. Second, reverent loyalty, very strong sense of power. The stronger the relationship you have and connection you have with individuals, the more likely they'll follow you and want to help you as the leader. That's why I said the byproduct of that is retention and of you know compassion and then the, you know now expertise power you're able to demonstrate expertise power and getting results now as you keep going up within your organization you know people will now follow you because in and you are able to in, you know have a wider net of influence because you also be, have been seen as a person or a leader who can develop other leaders because if you want to go higher up an organization, you know, you've got to develop your bench, and you got to be able to demonstrate you can develop your bench. So, you know, the they follow you now because not just because of your, your your compassion, your expertise, but you you know you have demonstrated the ability to develop others. So, is you know how do you connect with people? I'm gonna you know that. I remember, I don't know where I learned it, but I, you know, you, you should, this year we, a lot of people didn't have Christmas parties, but you know, we always, as you recall, Dan, when we, you know, we had get togethers, we would tell our people to, Hey, bring your spouse, bring your partner, bring your children. You know, even our national conferences, it was more family oriented from, you know, the old American express to the financial network. You know, we wanted to you know, get to know the families. Absolutely. If you're the leader, one of the things that I would recommend, you know, if the children are there, pay that person a compliment in front of their children or their spouse. You know, I just want to tell you, you know, and but you got to say it with sincerity and it's got to be accurate. If it's not, that's, you know, that's just a cookie cutter compliment and that's not going to go anywhere. So, but you know, I, you know, I really enjoy working with your, with your father. His, his knowledge and expertise is invaluable to us and it's helped us, you know, and, and cite the example, you know, that person, that father will, whoa, you will gain utmost res, higher level of respect. And so, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll go, they'll go over the top with you. Now, is that, are those levels of leadership naturally? in that order like with the five levels of mastery you, you have to work in in the in that order uh, with the levels of leadership is it is it possible to start out with having the title and then get results and then build compassion, the compassion or is it yeah that's, or that's right could you you know being a a line employee be a results getter and attain some leadership qualities, even without having the title uh, or the compassion. So that's those bottom three levels aren't necessarily one layered on the other, but the first one, the first one is the first one is the first one. Sure. Cause it's, it's your entry level into management. Right. And most of the people, you know, their first entry, they don't have the knowledge and skills to lead people. It, it really reminds me of my first, time I got a management job, uh, I was promoted at the same time as another person was hired from the outside. And after about three or four months, I remember him coming to me. And because we had become managers at the same time, we we went through the corporate trainings together. And, you know, we're always, you know, 
comparing notes and things like that. And at one point he, he wasn't a super empathetic person. He, he looked at me and he said, man, it just, I get really frustrated because it just seems like people like you a lot more than they like me. <laughs> <laughs> but to counter that, I was terrible at getting results. Uh, my, my empathy was off the charts. And because of that, I would let people get away with stuff that I, I really shouldn't have. Right. And he was the opposite. He was an autocrat and he was on his people all the time. And, and so somewhere in between would have been better. <laughs> would have but, been, would have been better. And, and so two and three, those levels, they can interchange, you know, just note if you're the autocrat, and you have that expertise and you have the power title, you can reward and punish. Some people need the job, so they, they're, they're going to stay there. But they're only going to stay there for as long as they have to. <laughs> then they're going to leave. You got someone who is the autocrat, their retention because of lack of compassion is terrible. Right. It's churn and burn. You just got to pour more in the top, right? right? So you got to, you know, they, the two and three can be interchangeable. Number the base, no. Because we all have to start someplace. So the other way to connect, though, I think about it, you know, how do you connect with people? Well, you know, that transparency or openness and sincerity, that's, that's, that's got to be there. And you, uh, and you, you know, don't, uh, I said I was going to bring him up, the legendary NFL coach of the 49ers, Joe Walsh, who, you know, you take a look, he, he, he fed a lot of, head coach positions throughout the NFL. He was a great teacher. And he said, nothing is, nothing is more effective than sincere, accurate praise. And nothing is more lame than the cookie cutter compliment. My old boss, Jim Choate used to say too, only give compliments when they're deserved. If you give them, you know, constantly, people aren't going to believe it. So just make sure it's, you know, it's an accurate compliment when you do give them. And, and boy, we talked about this, how to connect, know your audience. So we, we discussed that already, but so I won't belabor that other than, you know, you've got to meet them where they are, not, you're not having them meet you where you are. And I also, you know, when I'm meeting them and where they are, I like to remove all barriers. I've been you know, doing a lot of, you know, throughout my career, a lot of public speaking. I, that's what I love to do. Teach, teach in, in, uh, primarily is, is, and coach how, you know, um, and when I do those, you know, if I'm one-on-one -on -one or if I'm in front of a group, if I'm in front of a group and I got a big audience, I don't want to be behind a podium, never spoke from behind the podium. That's a barrier. I don't want to be way up high on stage. I will get in the people's, I'm known to be you know, the person to get in people's faces or get right amongst the crowd. I'll work the crowd. Get, you know, I, I know, you know, I want to be where they are and I want to have that one-on-one -on -one touch as much as possible. And when talking to audiences, the way you get the number, you know, you're able to touch them there is, boy, before you even, you know, speak to that audience, ask whoever's hired you to come out or you make sure if it's in you know, your own, know your people. Who's, who's that center of influence among those, amongst those uh, people you're going to talk to? Ask them, what do they want? Hey, I'm going to have to do this present. I'm doing this presentation. What do you want to see as outcomes? What, you know, what are your dreams for this company? And then reference them. Well, I've also seen you talk in front of groups and ask, you know, people's names or people's positions within the group, and you'll tie that in yeah. as well to to kind of build that rapport in in large groups. Qu quick question: sure. How does social style play into how you build this? Because when thinking about the praise side of things. I have one very, really specific instance in mind where it was an all company meeting at the insurance company that I was at. And I thought it was just going to be another kind of run of the mill. We're in a huge auditorium, I mean, a real theater. So the center section has 25 seats and I'm sitting dead in the middle of it. And all of a sudden my manager who I knew was speaking at, at the event 
calls me up on stage. Oh, I mean, you've referenced this. I get up and, oh, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me. You know, the, 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 t- um, uh, to be or not to be <laughs> seen, like all the way <laughs> down the aisle. And I have to walk up in front of, you know, 1500 people. And I'm not shy of being in front of groups or speaking if I'm prepared, but, I'm mortified if I'm brought out and praised in front of a bunch of people without knowing it. And obviously I I liked my manager. It wasn't a, you know, a deal breaker or ending, but it it made me extremely uncomfortable and social styles have to play. You have to be cognizant of that. So a little, little uh, pitch back to our social styles episode. Uh, If you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to it, but I'll, uh, let you answer my long-winded question. Well, first of all, the, your leader should have adri- knew what your social style was, and in 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 you know, if you're more introverted or on the analytical, not a high relationship, and in you know, you know, look, you like to be correct, you like to be prepared, you know, not this spontaneous. If you were a Raven expressive. Look out! You're a peacock. I'm, right, it's no problem. You know, get the get you, but get ready. You got to get the shepherd's hook because you're going to have to take that person off the right. stage. You run a risk with those people. You're right. yeah, you're going to be probably fairly short and to the point, and we move on. All right, but he should have let you, you know, given you a heads up. That that would have been the right thing to do. Right. The other is you know, um, it's just, you know, in the social styles itself, if you know some of the people in the audience and you're new using their names, well then, uh, and if you know their social styles, remember the base need of a amiable is to be loved, to be liked. Well, one, you know, so you give them a compliment. One of the reasons why you're so loved by the other people, you know, so many of these people in this auditorium right now is because you're there for them. You connect with them. You know, or that expressive, you know, their base need is to be what? Recognized. So, you know, okay, recognize them. Give them the recognition. You know what? I want to give Joel kudos. He has been number one in our sales organization for the last three years running. And I've asked, you know, Joel, can you you just stand up and let's give Joel a round of applause? Oh, you're going to get some mileage out of this. You know, um, and so that, you know, the driver's base needs to be controlled. So, you know, figure that, you know, in, in the analytical's base needs to be correct. Funny story there. Back when you were first teaching me social styles in the late 90s, my roommate and good friend, Tyler, was also hearing about social styles. And he, he and I are very different. I'm an analytic driver. He's you know, very, very, very expressive, amiable. And he said at one point, uh, he had, I think, finished his master's degree and had gone out in industry. And it was kind of a, a, as many industrial companies are not loaded with great management. And he was getting frustrated. And he told me this story about being in the lunchroom and his boss coming in and in front of his entire team, praising him. And he said, I felt my attitude changing as he was praising me. And the only thing I could think was my social style. (laughs) He's like, I've never had, he'd never realized before how important that was to him, but it, it literally did change his entire attitude. Just that one interaction of being praised. Whereas before he was coming back and complaining about the work and, and the way that things were being run. And, you know, he's like, and after that I was singing and whistling. (laughs) Oh, Sweetest things to people's ears is their name, you know. So, and, you know, and you know, there's that old Harvard business um, study. What are the four things employees want from their employers? What do you think the number one thing is? Recognition. Ah, that's number two. Okay. All right. Number one is appreciation. Mm. Number three is look. You got to give me the tools and knowledge to do the job. If you don't, you do not have the right to hold me accountable. And number four is money. Now, this, these are averages. So, just, you know, 
Some are going to be higher, some are going to be lower. But again, you know, it, what does it cost you to demonstrate that you appreciate someone or to recognize them? And as the leader, that brings me up to the number three. Look, you, you know, you got to develop them and you got to give them the tools and knowledge and skills to do the job. Because if you, know, you cannot set expectations, I would share with you, and, and not provide support. If you set expectations, you can, but if you don't provide support, you're going to erode trust. Setting, expectation, uh, setting expectations and providing support builds trust. Now, one of the number one killers in this connection, though, but going back to compassion that we're talking about here, is you got to live with integrity. We talked about that before. The three things here with the build up integrity, remember they were tell the truth, stand up for what's right, and do what you say you're going to do. So if you're preaching a vision, you're in your and or you know whatever your key message is and you know, you know if you're saying one thing and your behave and, and your behaviors are demonstrating something else that erodes trust so the byproduct of integrity is trustworthiness so live live is is consistent as you, you know, with your value live consistently within you know, with what you want to stand for i was just going to say in terms of consistency and I, I think I know the answer to this, but it's better to not do something than to say you're going to do it and oh. and not not do it. So like for example, one on ones I was terrible with, right? And there's really not a lot worse from a leadership standpoint than, hey, we're gonna meet on a weekly basis and then the manager is the one who's, oh yeah, no, I'm busy. I gotta push that back. Or oh yeah, no, we're not gonna be able to do that. We'll move it to next oh yeah, well we'll just catch up again next week. And then all of a sudden What's the message with that, Dan? You're not important. Thank you. Broke it. <laughs> Say no more. <laughs> You're not important. Right. So screw you. Yep. All right. All right. Here's the what I would say the number one killer, at least for me personally, and I have to is don't have the focus be on you. Have it be on them. That ro this is when you use you know you know it's okay to use the royal we here, but also on them. Don't be the narcissist. My team, my company. You know, you know this is what I do. That's going to wear thin on people. So put the focus on them. Again, they don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. And then you got to believe in them and help them through those, like you just described, through those one-on-ones to monitor direction, right? And help them throw off discouragement, you know, which you know, we're naturally, we're going to have as followers in anyone in a day-to-day but you got to believe in them and help them throw off that discouragement and you know, and let them also you know make sure they they out we every individual has innate strengths you got to help bring those out and put them in the right position where they they can shine and and I'd say that you know can well lastly on this one you got to you got to then as you're doing that monitoring progress and throwing off uh, discouragement your one-on-ones, you're, you're providing, you're offering the direction there and you're providing the hope. Katrina, he was indifferent. There is no hope. Those people sitting there, they had to seek it from them, you know, themselves. Where, where's the federal government? So you got to give people hope. And there's that old saying too, people, you know, leadership without, uh, People without a vision will just perish. So that hope is also sharing that vision where you want to go. And I and I think it was Napoleon. Let me look. You know, I, I, Napoleon. He he was you know the French general said leaders are dealers in hope. And that's so true. And he was he could lead. He could you know, the world could have been different without Waterloo. <laughs> Right. <laughs> we all might be speaking French, right? Or you take a look at the two leaders back in World War II. There was just a handful of countries that were this democracy was, you know, was a fledgling, you know, 
institution. And without Franklin and without Winston, that gave you know shared a vision and gave hope, and particularly Winston at the beginning. Without Winston, ooh, we, this whole world could have been different. Yeah, the Battle of Britain, to a large degree, was won by a handful of people you know, in the, the Royal young Air men Force. in the air. Yep, but based purely on hope, yeah, <laughs> they were hope. outnumbered yeah. and uh, had a had a few other advantages, radar and things yeah. like that. But to to a large degree, you're right. It was it was hope. Where was he? He wasn't in his bunker. Where was Edward, King Edward? They got out and they were amongst the people and they made sure they were seen and, you know, and it wasn't because they wanted to give that hope. They stayed. He could have moved out to the country. Heck no. He stayed right there in London. So did King George and his family. And, you know, now the queen, she was just a youngster at the time, but they stayed right there. Excellent. Well, that will wrap up our main section for this week. I did just want to point out one thing. Uh, Joe Walsh did not coach the 49ers. That was Bill. Uh, Joe Walsh was a guitarist for the Eagles. (laughs) Well spoken. Yes, it was Bill. Joe. Joe. You got it right the first time. The second time you you snuck in Joe Walsh on us. So I had had to keep that to the end for you. So... We will now pivot to our article review for the week. Our article review is uh, 28 questions to access your pandemic pivot. This is a topic that I've been really fascinated with ever since the beginning of the whole COVID crisis in that In the first few months, everybody, including myself, I think really looked at it as an event. And the longer we get into this, the more and more it becomes evident that that it wasn't actually an event. It was a, a shift in the way the world works <laughs> and is going to work going forward. And so instead of reacting by saying, okay, what are we going to do in the short term so that we can go back to business as usual two, three, four months from now? Businesses are starting to look at it from the standpoint of saying, okay, how am I now going to adapt to this new reality? And I just thought there were some great questions in here. Um, They're they're broken out into different sections. And of course, I'll put a link uh, on our website and we'll also uh, tweet out a link to it. Uh, But the areas are relationship management, marketing, practice management, technology, and team leadership. And actually, the first one that I want to pick out is the very first question. And I think it ties in nicely with our topic this week. Are you consistently providing superior financial guidance while strengthening your emotional connection with both clients and centers of influence? And that I think is a number one should be the focus of anyone at this point is realizing that Hey, we are in a world where many clients now are going to prefer this less personal form of interaction. And let's face it, doing a Zoom call is not as personal as meeting face to face. And so how are you going to strengthen that connection and build that rapport with clients? Now, there are many clients that advisors are going to have already had, so they already have some of that built. But with new clients, how are you going to start building that going forward? And I think if you're not doing it already, values-based approach is is really transcendent. Mm -hmm. Using a values-based approach, even in a distance format, is a great way to open up that that emotional connection with the client again focusing on numbers you know investment performance all of those things 
is going to be brutal. <laughs> it's brutal in person, but it's going to be even more brutal. In fact, my own financial advisor, uh, when his assistant called to set up my annual appointment, she said, oh, do you want to do a, a Zoom online meeting so he can show you reports and, and graphs? And I'm like, no, no, I don't need any of that. <laughs> we can just talk. <laughs> so, but that that to me was one that really jumped out um, as, as something that I think many advisors need to start taking a look at. I'd agree, Dan. And, and I think, you know, if uh, the article that you referenced, they said, you know, the key to any disruption is addressing it strategically. I, I agree with that. The, you know, strategy is the what? The how is an implementation. And I would, there's an old saying, 90% of uh, uh, success is uh, implementation and 10% is strategy. you got to have the strategy, don't get me wrong, but then you need to be constantly in communication with your people during this time of disruption so you can make the adjustments as you go. So I, you know, you know, this connection of the uh, emotional connection, you need to be at, you know, I, it goes back to one of our first podcasts, you know, and we tied this into the 9-11 and the Merrill Lynch study. You know, the first thing people want to have from their advisor or their leader is touching their heart. How are they feeling, you know, uh, about this COVID? And still right now today, I still think it's relevant because uh, it's going on and on. Now we're in the second wave. Got to make that connection. And then you got to make sure, I think, personally, you know, that that 90% of success comes in implementation. You need to start taking a look at, you know, you, as you said, Dan, the world, it's it's a shift. And it's a paradigm shift. So now you've got to accurately assess your readiness level to deliver in this new digital world. You, because you've got to meet your clients where they want to be uh, met. You know, as we, you know, and some, you know, in larger metropolitan areas, you know, they were, aha, man, this is saving time. And I'm still productive. Well, if you have the relationship you, and you have uh, high integrity, well, then you... You've, you're trustworthy. And if you're, tr you know, if you have people's trust, details don't matter. If you don't have their trust, all the details in the world aren't going to help you out. So and that's what you like, those mountain charts that you describe charts, forget that. So the values based, as you said, finding out what their values are, connecting those values then to their goals, and then helping them make better decisions. That's going to, um, I think, bode better for you, but you better make sure you get digital and you make it, uh, uh, it can be more two way and interactive. So and that's your strength, not mine. Right. That's the question that I pulled out of the marketing section actually is, are you strategically using social media as both a relationship management and a marketing tool? Does this include video? You know, shameless plug. If you're not out there using platforms and using audio and video, or you need, to learn how to do that, that's definitely something that we can help you out with, uh, whether it's doing it for you or training you how to build short videos, build audio, record a podcast, those kind of things. We're more than happy to work with you on on that side of things. And in fact, are working with an advisor that we worked with last year in a just general training and, uh, you know, client uh, service model training, which now has transitioned into helping him go virtual. And that leads into the, the sales question that I pulled out, question 11, what could you do to improve your virtual meetings? First thing that jumps out to me there, A, number one is practice, 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 practice. Have you done it with, you know, going back to when you learn your first sales presentation, mm. what do you always say about your first sales presentation? Go home and Give it to your partner, give it to your roommate, you know, go practice that sales presentation. When I was training internals, that's what we would have them do is, you know, go home. And in fact, I, I remember one of my advisors at one point saying, 
she lost her daughter in the supermarket and she found uh, her four-year-old daughter had pinned somebody up against the dairy case and was trying to sell him, uh, sell them investment company of America from American funds because the daughter had heard the sales pitch so often. <laughs> so practice, practice, practice. That's also something that we can help you out with. Like I mentioned, we're helping advisors go virtual and we can work with you on your virtual presentations. Well, I was going to say, you know, I'll do the, you know, just even build on that, Dan, because we, we, people want to learn more. We have a, a, a complete manual on this that uh, it's client service with purpose and how to create competitive immunity where there's pre agendas there are materials you know, and tools that you can use in the digital world now in how to interact and, and develop their, their goals and you know, actually develop emotionally compelling goals. And, and I would uh, strongly have uh, people, if they're interested, uh, to reach out to you, Dan, and we can set up a 30-minute you know, consultation at no fee to walk them through uh, some of our... Uh, some of our tools to see if they can be of help. Absolutely. Any other questions that uh, from the article that jump out at you? No, I you know, just what you said, Dan. And I would just only elaborate. You know, um, this isn't the time to be on the cheap. Uh, you you had me go out and get a you know a Marantz turret, you know, a professional mic a professional camera. Uh, if you, you know, one of the, I think you shared with me, you know, uh, and I, and I, we've also from people we've interviewed who've listened to our and uh, surveyed uh, our podcast, uh, you need to, you know, got to make sure it, the quality's good. That's the number one thing. If the quality isn't good, they're going to hang up on you. So. Absolutely. Everything in the technology section of the article, do you use cloud-based file sharing? Does everyone have high-speed internet? Does everyone have a quality webcam? Does everyone have a quality microphone? You know, this isn't, you know, 25, 30 years ago where microphones are insanely expensive. The microphone that I use costs less than a hundred bucks, plugs right into your computer, USB compatible. It loads up everything and, and is plug and play. So you can get quality professional gear for very reasonable prices and it does make a difference using the that quality gear does does really show that you're you're committed to that so again if that's something many advisors don't know a lot about uh also uh, available to help folks out with that so we will wrap oh, up Dan, the Dan. yeah i I'm not uh, someone you're interviewing, but remember we have a, a, oftentimes we ask the people we're interviewed, what's one quote or one pearl of wisdom you can share? Mm -hmm. Well, I have one. Okay. <laughs> Just, you know, good things aren't cheap and cheap things aren't good. <laughs> yeah. Without the, the related saying that I like is we're not rich enough to buy cheap things. <laughs> <laughs> I love that one. I, I've, I've heard it is a, as a Scandinavian saying, but then actually I also heard it from, uh, I saw someone from Russia uh, using that. So it's somewhere in the, in the, the n Northern European realm. <laughs> oh yes. Oh, absolutely. But back to you, closer down, Dan. In, uh... Sounds good. We will wrap up for this week. If you have topics that you would like us to cover or questions for us, you can email us at info at value-ability.com. Again, that's info at value-ability.com. Or you can reach out to us on social media. All of our links, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook are at value-ability.com under the Contact Us tab. Please, wherever you find us, the mantra of podcasters everywhere. Like, review, subscribe, and share. Next week, episode 42, we have a special guest, Will Steiner from Big Later. A very 
interesting website that has a different take on uh, investment education. So tune in next week to check that out. What parts of your practice have you pivoted already from 2020 into 2021? And what things are you focusing on in 2021 that are going to be permanent changes for you going forward? Reach out to us and let us know. We will share those in future episodes. As always, thank you for listening. Be sure to join us next week. And remember that financial success comes from building a plan on the foundation of your values and building your ability will help you get there. This is a podcast collaboration, not a peer-reviewed journal or a sponsored publication. We make no representations as to accuracy, completeness, correctness, suitability, or validity of any information in this podcast and will not be liable for any errors, omissions, or delays in this information or any losses, injuries, or damages arising from its display or use. All information is provided on an as-is basis. It is the listener's responsibility to verify their own facts. You should be aware of the real risk of loss in following any strategy or investment discussed on this podcast. Strategies or investments discussed may fluctuate in price or value. Investors may get back less than invested. Investments or strategies mentioned on this podcast may not be suitable for you. This material does not take into account your particular investment objectives, financial situation, or needs, and is not intended as recommendations appropriate for you. You must make an independent decision regarding investments or strategies mentioned on this podcast. Before acting on information on this podcast, you should consider whether it is suitable for your particular circumstances and strongly consider seeking advice from your own financial or investment advisor. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the authors and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of any other agency, organization, employer, or company. Assumptions are not reflective of the position of any entity other than the authors, and since we are critically thinking human beings, these views are always subject to change, revision, and rethinking at any time. Please do not hold us to them in perpetuity. Mm -hmm.